Chapter 8 Happiness, Music, Dance, and the Kiss Only love and wisdom should reign in the homes of Gnostic brethren. In reality, humanity confuses love with desire and desire with love. Only great souls can and know how to love. In Eden, perfect men love ineffable women. In order to love, we must be. Those who incarnate their soul truly know how to love. The eye does not know how to love. The demon eye that today swears love is replaced by the demon eye that does not feel like loving. We already know the eye is plural. The pluralized eye is really legion. This whole succession of the eye is in constant battle. It is said we have one mind, nevertheless we Gnostics affirm that we have many minds. Each phantasm of the pluralized eye has its own mind. The eye that kisses and adores his beloved wife is replaced by the eye that hates her. One must first be in order to love, man still is not. Whoever has not incarnated the soul is not, man still does not have real existence. A legion of demons speak out of man's mouth. These are demons who swear love. Demons who abandon their beloved. Demons who hate. Demons of jealousy, anger, resentment, etc. Nevertheless, the intellectual animal, mistakenly called man, despite everything, has incarnated the essence, a fraction of his human soul, the Bodhata. It knows how to love. The I does not know how to love. We must forgive the defects of our beloved because these defects are of the I. Love is not to blame for disagreements. The I is the guilty one. The homes of Gnostic initiates must have a backdrop of happiness, music, and ineffable kisses. Dance, love, and the joy of loving strengthen the embryo of the soul that children have within. This is how Gnostic homes are a true paradise of love and wisdom. Liquor and fornication must be banished from the bosom of Gnostic homes. However, we must not be fanatics. Whosoever is incapable of handling one drink at a social gathering is as weak as someone who doesn't know how to control his liquor and gets drunk. Fornication is another thing. That is unpardonable. Whoever ejaculates the seminal liquor is a fornicator. For those, for fornicators, the abyss and second death. Man can be a part of everything, but should not be the victim of anything. He must be the king and not the slave. Someone who has had a drink has not committed a crime, but the one who becomes a slave and victim of that drink has committed a crime. The true master is a king of the heavens, earth, and infernos. The weak one is not king, the weak one is a slave. The initiate only unites sexually with his spouse in order to practice sexual magic. Miserable is the one who unites with his spouse in order to spill the semen. The initiate does not experience the feeling of death that fornicators feel when they lose their semen. Man is one half, and woman is the other half. During the sexual act, they experience the joy of being complete. Those who do not spill the semen preserve this joy eternally. In order to create a child, it is not necessary to spill the semen. The spermatozoan that escapes without spilling the semen is a select spermatozoan. A superior kind of spermatozoan, a totally mature spermatozoan. The result of such fecundation is truly a new creature of the highest order. This is how we can form a race of supermen. It is not necessary to spill the semen in order to engender a child. Imbeciles like to spill the semen. The Gnostic is not an imbecile. When a couple is sexually united, clairvoyants often see a very bright light enveloping the couple. Precisely in that moment, the creative forces of nature serve as a medium for the creation of a new being. When the couple gets carried away with carnal passion and then commits the crime of spilling the semen, those luminous forces withdraw, and in their place, luciferic forces of a blood-red color penetrate, which bring quarrels, jealousy, adultery, weeping, and desperation to the home. That is how homes that could be a heaven on earth become true infernos. People who do not spill their semen retain and accumulate for themselves peace, abundance, wisdom, happiness, and love. Arguments within homes can be eliminated with the key of sexual magic. This is the key to true happiness. During the act of sexual magic, couples charge themselves with magnetism. They mutually magnetize. In the woman, feminine currents flow from the pelvis, while the breasts emit masculine ones. In the man, the feminine current is in the mouth and the masculine in his virile member. All these organs must be well excited through sexual magic in order to give and receive, transmit and gather vital magnetic forces that increase extraordinarily in quantity and quality. Delightful dance, joyful music, and the ardent kiss in the house of Gnostic initiates 
where couples come into such intimate sexual contact, have as their objective the attainment of mutual magnetization of man and woman. The magnetic power is masculine and feminine at the same time. The man needs his wife's currents if he truly wishes to progress, and the woman inevitably needs her husband's currents in order to achieve the development of her powers. When a couple mutually magnetizes, business progresses, and happiness makes a nest in the home. When a man and woman unite, something is created. Scientific chastity allows transmutation of the sexual secretions into light and fire. Every religion that degenerates preaches celibacy. Every religion at its birth and in its glorious splendor preaches the path of perfect matrimony. Buddha was married and established the perfect matrimony. Unfortunately, after 500 years, the prophecy made by the Lord Buddha that his dharma would be exhausted and the sangha would divide into dissident sects was fulfilled with complete accuracy. That was when Buddhist monasticism and hatred of perfect matrimony was born. Jesus, the divine savior, brought Christic esotericism to the world. The adorable one taught his disciples the path of perfect matrimony. Peter, the first pontiff of the church, was a married man. Peter was not celibate. Peter had a wife. Unfortunately, after 600 years, the message of the adorable one was adulterated and the dead forms of Buddhist monasticism returned to the Church of Rome with its cloistered monks and nuns who mortally hate the path of perfect matrimony. It was then, after 600 years of Christianity, that another message about perfect matrimony became necessary. Then came Muhammad, the great preacher of perfect matrimony. Naturally, as always, Muhammad was violently rejected by infrasexuals who hate the woman. The disgusting brotherhood of the enemies of women believe that only by compulsory celibacy can one reach God. This is a crime. Abstinence, as preached by infrasexuals, is absolutely impossible. Nature rebels against such types of abstention. Then come nocturnal pollutions that inevitably ruin the organism. Every abstemious individual suffers nocturnal seminal spillage. A cup that fills up will inevitably overflow. The luxury of abstention is only possible for those who have already reached the kingdom of the Superman. They have converted their organisms into machines of eternal sexual transmutation. They have educated their glands with sexual magic. They are men gods. They are the result of many years of sexual magic and rigorous education in sexual physiology. The initiate loves great classical music and feels repugnance for the infernal music of vulgar people. Afro-Cuban music awakens man's lowest animal instincts. The initiate loves the music of the great composers. For example, the magic flute by Mozart reminds us of an Egyptian initiation. There is an intimate relationship between the word and the sexual forces. The word of the great master Jesus had been Christified by drinking the wine of light of the alchemist in the chalice of sexuality. The soul communes with the music of the spheres when we listen to the nine symphonies of Beethoven, or the compositions of Chopin, or the divine Polonaise of Liszt. Music is the word of the eternal. Our words must be ineffable music. Thus, we sublimate the creative energy to the heart. Disgusting, filthy, immodest, and vulgar words have the power to adulterate the creative energy, converting it into infernal powers. In the mysteries of Eleusis, sacred dances, dances in the nude, the ardent kiss, and sexual connection converted men into gods. It would have occurred to no one to think of perversities, but only of holy and profoundly religious matters. Sacred dances are as ancient as the world and have their origin in the dawn of life on earth. Sufi dances and dancing dervishes are tremendously marvelous. Music should awaken in the human organism for the word of gold to be spoken. The great rhythms of Mahavan and Chodavan with their three eternal bars, sustain the universe steady in its motion. They are the rhythms of the fire. When the soul floats delightfully in sacred space, it must accompany us with its song, because the universe is sustained by the word. The house of Gnostic initiates must be full of beauty. The flowers that perfume the air with their aroma, beautiful sculptures, perfect order and cleanliness, make of each home a true Gnostic sanctuary. The mysteries of Eleusis still exist in secrecy. The great Baltic initiate, von Oxkel, is one of the most exalted initiates of that school. That great initiate practices sexual magic intensely. We must clarify that sexual magic can only be practiced between husband and wife. The male or female adulterer inevitably fails. You can only be married when there is love. Love is law, but conscious love. 
Those who use this knowledge of sexual magic in order to seduce women are black magicians who will tumble into the abyss where wailing and the second death await them, which is thousands of times worse than the death of the physical body. We make an urgent call to the maidens who walk the world, to the naive women. We warn you that you can only practice sexual magic when you have your husband. Take care against such sly foxes who go around seducing naive damsels with the pretext of sexual magic. We warn you so you do not fall into temptation. We also call to the unredeemed fornicators who populate the world. We warn that it is useless to try to hide before the eyes of the Eternal. Those poor women who utilize this knowledge as a pretext in order to satisfy their lust and to lie in beds of pleasure will fall into the abyss where all that awaits them is weeping and the gnashing of teeth. We speak clearly so we will be understood. Go back, profane and profaneous. Sexual magic is a double-edged sword. It transforms the pure and virtuous into gods. It wounds and destroys the wicked and impure.